Good morning, everyone, uh, or perhaps it's uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where you are around the world uh, for this uh, a very uh, first, for me, uh, effort to reach out with an online seminar. And today we're going to be talking about Dr. John Snow and his life and his contributions. Uh, I want to uh, thank uh, a number of people who were responsible for putting this together. Um, but first, I wanted to just make sure that uh, everybody who understands um, and is involved in this presentation uh, will give us a little bit of patience uh, with the tech any technical difficulties that arise. Um, we have a, a number of people who are going to be talking about the uh, life of Dr. John Snow. We have a, a stellar team of, of folks that will be discussing his life. Um, uh, we are going to be talking about his contributions to public health, uh, to drinking water quality, to epidemiology, and his con contributions to anesthesiology. This is all, of course, uh, in honor of his birthday, which is coming up in a few days on March 15th. Uh, the 200th anniversary of his birth uh, will be uh, on March 15, 2013. We have uh, people who are involved in this seminar, uh, as I said, from around the world, uh, mostly in the United States, but uh, in fact, uh, Denver, Washington, I'm sorry, Denver Best um, uh, is from Michigan. Uh, we have people from London, California, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois, South Carolina, and Denver, Colorado. Um, without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, really get into the next effort, which is to talk about the organizers for this seminar. Um, Denver Vest is the executive director of wastewatereducation.org. And she has really done an amazing job in putting together the technical, the very important technical aspects of this seminar. Um, this is new technology for me. I've never done anything quite like this before. And Denver has just been wonderful in setting this up and, and uh, nurturing us along, those of us who haven't been involved in this before. Uh, John Koku, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today. but. John was also very instrumental in uh, organizing the seminar. Um, he helped get speakers and was uh, a great sounding board uh, and very useful from all of his, his experience in the drinking water community. Um, the next slide I'm going to talk about is the actual um, agenda for our, our seminar coming up. Uh, the First author uh, to talk will be Sandra Hempel from the UK, and she is going to discuss uh, something that I think is so important, uh, and that is to understand a bit more about Jon Snow the Man. Uh, her book, uh, The Strange Case of the Broad Street Pump, is uh, something that I think is uh, really an excellent uh, uh, book and is going to be uh, part of the basis for what she's going to tell us. The next, uh, I'm going to talk about the legacy of Dr. John Snow, specifically with regard to water filtration and chlorination in the United States during the early part of the 20th century. Uh, Steve Villa is going to uh, discuss uh, Dr. John Snow and his impact on U.S. regulations of drinking water. Uh, Steve is with the American Water Works, Works Association and, uh, and an old friend of mine. Uh, we've worked together many years on uh, drinking water regulations. Uh, we're going to have a five-minute break uh, after the first three presentations. Um, allow you to go get a cup of coffee or do whatever. Um, each uh, of these talks will be about 15 minutes uh, with five minutes of questions afterwards. Um, uh, please don't uh, interrupt the um, speaker, uh, but you certainly can, of, of course, uh, ask questions by using the chat window in the lower left-hand part of your screen. You can just type something in and hit return, and we will see your question, which we can then answer at the end of our various talks. Uh, after our five-minute um, break, uh, I'm very uh, excited to tell you about Lindsay Olson, who is uh, 
an artist in residence uh, and a, a teacher of art, uh, but someone who has been uh, uh, involved in the uh, intersection of wastewater and art. And she is an artist and she makes art and she is uh, very, uh, uh, well I just think that her work is, is great and, and we're going to see some of her work uh, on the slides today. Uh, Deborah Falter is at Clemson University and will talk more about the medical history of uh, the contributions of Dr. John Snow, uh, talking about miasma and death and, and the disease cholera and how all this related to the beginnings of our understanding of the germ theory of disease. Uh, all of Dr. Snow's efforts really were before uh, we had a decent theory to uh, put forward on how diseases were caused. Uh, and then finally, uh, Shelley Wallingford uh, with the National Environmental Health Association is going to talk about the sanitarian profession and how far we've come and the impact of Dr. Snow uh, on the development of that profession. So that is our, our schedule for the day. Um, I'm going to go to the first uh, presentation now and, and introduce uh, Sandra Hempel. Uh, as I mentioned, she's someone who I've known about for a number of years. I read her book, uh, The Strange Case of the Broad Street Pump, and it was very helpful for me to understand uh, who John Snow was and uh, how he how he made his contributions to the various aspects of, as I mentioned, public health um, and epidemiology and so forth. And so we are going to get a very human uh, look at Dr. Snow, and uh, Sandra is going to give that to us all the way from the United Kingdom. So Sandra, please take it away. Uh, but before you do, I want to make sure that everybody knows that you have a new book coming out, uh, which is called The Inheritor's Powder, a very interesting uh, discussion of uh, history and arsenic and poisonings uh, and uh, technology. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. It's coming out in June of 2013. So with that, uh, Sandra, please tell us about John Snow, the man. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for that very, very nice introduction. And I'm absolutely delighted to be taking part in this event to celebrate the great John Snow. And uh, my talk is based on my book, The Medical Detective, as, as Mike has said. And it's really John Snow, the man behind the achievement. He took no wine nor strong drink. He lived on anchorite fare, clothed plainly, kept no company, and found every amusement in his science books, his experiments, and simple exercises. So wrote the physician, Benjamin Ward Richardson, about his friend, the reclusive genius, Dr. John Snow. As Richardson suggests, the intensely private doctor was a difficult man to get to know. Richardson also remarked after Snow's death, all who knew him said he was a very quiet man, very reserved and peculiar, a clever man, but not easy to be understood. Snow's appearance was as unobtrusive as his personality. He was slim and of medium height, with small features and a calm, gentle expression. And while his difficulties in getting his ideas about cholera accepted were largely due to just how revolutionary they were, his painful reticence must also have proved a drawback. The eldest of nine children, he was born on the 15th of March, 1813, in humble circumstances in the city of York in the north of England. He went to a local school for working-class children, but a rich uncle almost certainly paid for his medical education. Rather than studying at Oxford or Cambridge, John Snow followed the tougher, cheaper route into medicine by being apprenticed to an apothecary surgeon. In Snow's case, this meant leaving his family at the age of 14 to spend five years in Newcastle, some 80 miles away. It was as an apprentice at the age of 19, that Snow had his first encounter with a much feared disease called cholera. This appeared on English soil in 1831 on the northeast coast, just a few miles from Newcastle where Snow was. The following year, struggling to cope with the cholera cases on his doorstep, Snow's master, William Hardcastle, sent his apprentice off quite alone 
to cope with an outbreak at a nearby pit village. Cholera was a shock disease, even at a time when people were familiar with deadly diseases. It can kill within two hours of the symptoms coming on, and those symptoms, violent vomiting and diarrhoea, followed by excruciating muscle cramps, the skin often turning blue or black, and the living body shriveling like a corpse, were terrifying. John Snow never forgot what he saw at the mining village. There was little he could do for the victims, there was no effective treatment, and no one understood how the disease was spreading, and therefore how to prevent it. But the episode sparked in him an interest that led to the work that was to become his legacy. When he'd finished his apprenticeship, Snow came to London to complete his medical education. He enrolled at a private school for his lectures and at Westminster Hospital for tuition and clinical practice, sharing rooms with a fellow student, Joshua Parsons, in a poor part of Soho. Medical students had a reputation for wild behaviour. But a strict teetotaler, John Snow's idea of recreation was a long hike over the Yorkshire moors or a swim down the River Tyne. In London, he and Parsons spent most of their time poring over textbooks or working late in the dissection room at the medical school. One set of exams that he had to pass were those set by the Worshipful Company of Apothecaries. The editor of the Medical Journal, The Lancet, described what a candidate could expect when he turned up for his ordeal. The guide had conducted the candidates into a large room in which, if after dinner cups had not presented, 12 examiners are found at first at four tables. It is quite another accident, a lottery, whether the candidate is examined by a pert puppy or an empty-headed bully, by a self-satisfied sneer or a superficial professor who has at any rate a due sense of the proprieties of life and might behave like a gentleman. Snow passed not only these exams, but also those set by the Royal College of Surgeons. He moved to a better address, although still in Soho, and nailed up his colours as a medical man, as he described it. He later went on to obtain his MD, thus becoming a physician at the top of the medical hierarchy. In 1846, when ether was first used in surgery in Britain, Snow was already carrying out research into respiration and asphyxia. He went on to build up a solid anaesthesia practice and in the early 1850s administered chloroform to Queen Victoria at the birth of two of her children. According to Joshua Parsons, though, Snow had no interest in money or fame. The naked truth for its own sake was what he sought and loved, Parsons said. No consideration of honour or profit seemed to have the power to buy his opinions on any subject. In 1849, Snow set out the then revolutionary idea that cholera was a disorder of the digestive system, not the blood, as many then thought. That it was contagious and spread through the oral fecal route, largely through contaminated drinking water. The wider view at the time, however, was that epidemic disease was caused by miasma, the bad smells given off by rotting organic material, and Snow's ideas were dismissed. His intervention in Broad Street, Soho, in 1854, when he persuaded the authorities to remove the handle from a contaminated pump well, has caught the public imagination. But it was his so-called grand experiment that same year that secured his reputation in epidemiology. He compared the numbers of cholera victims whose water was supplied by two different companies in South London. Customers of the Southwark and Vauxhall Company that took its supplies unfiltered from the Thames in central London, right next to the spot where the sewers were discharged, had a between eight and nine times higher risk of dying of cholera than those customers of the Lambeth Company whose works were upriver out of reach of the sewage. Snow's anaesthesia practice brought him financial security, but he was never rich, largely because he regularly treated poorer people for no fee. When Snow and Richardson first met, Richardson was living in a village on the Thames, southwest of London, and Snow would often travel down to help him at the end of his own working day, whenever Richardson asked, usually to see a non-paying patient. Returning as cheerily as though he'd received the heaviest fee, Richardson said. 
While his reserve made it hard for Snow to make friends, those who did come to know him loved him. They discovered loyalty and great kindness, as well as a surprising hidden talent for telling funny anecdotes. In later life, he even came out of his shell enough to visit the opera occasionally. And while Richardson could never persuade him that reading novels was anything other than a frivolous waste of time, he sometimes enjoyed hearing amusing passages from Dickens or Thackeray being read to him. Despite his wholesome lifestyle, Snow's health was never good. He was plagued with kidney problems throughout his life and had two bouts of what was probably tuberculosis. By 1858, he had risen, risen up the social scale to occupy a house in Saxon Street off London's fashionable Piccadilly. On the night of the 9th of June, he went to bed at his usual time at 11.30, seemingly well. But when he came downstairs the next morning, his housekeeper noticed he seemed unsteady on his feet and he said he felt a little giddy. Then the housekeeper heard a loud thud and ran to find her master struggling on the floor. He appeared to have lost the use of his left arm and leg and his mouth was twisted to the right. At six o'clock the next morning, he began vomiting blood. By now, he was paralysed down the entire left side of his body and over the next couple of days, gradually began to slide in and out of delirium. On June 16th, a week after he had fallen ill, his doctors felt that the time had come to tell him that his life was in danger. He received the news with the calm with which he'd met both good and bad fortune throughout his life, and he died at three o'clock that afternoon from what had almost certainly been a stroke with his brother Thomas at his bedside. He was just 45. He left behind a modest but growing reputation. Despite many setbacks and disadvantages, he had achieved some professional success, largely through his anaesthesia practice. His ideas on colour were still widely regarded as bizarre, but his obvious intelligence, diligence and integrity had slowly won him the respect of his colleagues. Even so, it had been an austere and solitary existence, consisting almost solely of work and study. There were no personal diaries or private letters. There was no widow or children to mourn him. He had confided to Richardson that he regretted never marrying, and Richardson had noticed how at home he seemed with friends' families. As news of Snow's death spread, some of those who had worked with him spoke of their sadness and admiration. Dr. Hooper Atree, a former house surgeon at the Middlesex Hospital, called for some sort of public tribute to Snow. Who does not remember his frankness, his cordiality, his honesty, the absence of all disguise or affectation under an apparent offhand manner? He asked. Her Majesty the Queen has been deprived of the future valuable services of a trustworthy, well-deserving, much-esteemed subject. The poor have lost in him a real friend in the hour of need. That public tribute was forthcoming in the form of an imposing memorial that now stands over Snow's grave in London's Brompton Cemetery. And in Broad Street in Soho, there is a replica of the pump well. In the 1950s, a Victorian pub opposite the pump was renamed after him. However, as a lifelong campaigner against the evils of alcohol, we can only guess at what he would have thought about that. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Sandra. That was that was wonderful. Okay. That was oh. great. Thank you. Oh, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure.